You know, there's something special that happens in a place. Something special that happens in a place when everybody's going after the same thing. And uh, when, when the church goes after more of God and more of who he is, it's a, it's a beautiful and powerful thing. Um, I felt that this morning. Hopefully you did too. Um, but we're in week two of this series on the practice, the spiritual practice of generosity. Last week, we talked about how through, all throughout the Bible, the story that Scripture tells us is that it all belongs to God, that it's all His, that He owns it all, and we're just caretakers. We're called to steward it. And so we looked at this idea of what biblical stewardship is and, and how to take the resources that God has entrusted to us uh, in order that he might give us more resources to entrust us with, that we might be generous on every occasion. And this week, we're going to be discussing how we might overcome something that oftentimes blocks or gets in the way of our ability to be generous, which is greed. Uh, I've been a pastor for 17 years. I know that's hard to believe because of how handsome and young I look, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, I've been in ministry now for 17 years, and uh, throughout that time, I've heard several, I mean, so many confessions of sin uh, in people's lives. It, it comes with the job, and, and I love it. Um, and, but I, I've heard confessions uh, that across the board of, or, of pornography addiction, of, of drug addiction, of abortions, of, of just so many different things. And... Um, but in all of those confessions, I have yet to hear anyone confess greed. Not once. See, greed is something that's very subtle, but also very normal. It impacts each of us more than probably we realize. It isn't uh, all that obvious because honestly, we live in such a greed driven culture. Our society is, is so driven by, by more and the, the pursuit of more. And we don't even realize how pervasive and sinful it has become in our own lives. So, if like you, or if you like me, have never heard anyone confess greed, let me be the first to confess I'm greedy, okay? Like, I'm right there. The new shiny stuff often gets the best of me. You know, experts say that um, somewhere between three to 5,000 times a day we are exposed to advertisements. Three to 5,000 times a day. We live in a world that I like to call digital Babylon. This is a place that uh, marketing is no longer just on billboards or even in TV commercials, but is actually attached to algorithms that play to our fears and desires and are accumulated based on what we talk about with our friends, whether it's a new pair of shoes or a new cell phone. We have this surveillance device in the front right pocket of our pants that is is listening to every single word and as soon as we get done with that conversation we open up our phones and right there within our news feed and on our websites there is all the ads for those shoes and those phones and everything else that we talk about harvard professor uh, shoshana zuboff calls it surveillance capitalism but long before we dealt with this type of struggle, people have been buying Smith of more. That if we just have a little bit more, we would be happy. But the truth is, no matter how much we get, it's never enough. It's never enough. The writer of Ecclesiastes says it this way in chapter five. He says, whoever loves money never has enough Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And this is true because the more we get, the more we want. Maybe you've heard what Rockefeller said when he was asked the question of like, how much money is enough money? He said, just a little bit more. <laughs> you know, um, 
Not only does more money not make us actually more happy, it makes us less happy. In fact, it's, it's, studies would show that, that more money actually makes us more anxious, more distracted, more discontent, less trusting, and more lonely. Therefore, it comes as no surprise, or shouldn't come as any surprise, that the majority of Jesus' teachings on money are warnings about its danger and how we must be careful with it. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, he says, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Greed is like lust, but, in it, it, but it's for things. It's a desire for more than what we have and more than what we need. And Jesus makes it clear that there are all kinds of greed. There is like a materialistic kind of greed that's like, oh, I want the bigger house, I want the newer car, I want the bigger TV. But then there's also this like specialized kind of greed that is more about giving yourself to exotic experiences and boutique fashion and eating at fine dining establishments. It's about it's not as much about stuff as it is about our identity and the way in which we interact with the world and the way people view us and see us. Hence is why Jesus says, watch out. Because we're all vulnerable to some form of greed or another. So watch out. Be on guard. Why is it so dangerous? Well, that comes in the next line of Jesus' teaching here in, in Luke 12. He says, because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus isn't saying that things are bad. He isn't saying that, like, man, like great vacations and great meals are bad things or horrible things. He's just saying the abundant life, the good life, just isn't found in those things. It isn't found in that stuff. But it's also dangerous because it impacts the type of soil that we actually become. Whether or not we're going to be good soil or not. Look at this teaching from Jesus in Mark chapter 4. He says, Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. This is Jesus' famous parable of the sower, and he doesn't say that wealth is evil. He just says that it's deceitful. It tricks you. It tricks you into believing certain lies, ultimately leading you to a way of being unfruitful. Now you couple that with what Jesus says about our enemy, Satan, in John chapter 8, where he says that he is the father of lies. You begin to see that the enemy can and will use money. And not only can he and will he use money, likely he has used money in all of our lives to keep our lives from being less fruitful with God's word. Because he tries to get us to believe in promises that it cannot provide. Promises like happiness and contentment and safety and security and identity. He, he tries to lure you in to make you think that this is what money can give you and it can't. It is a promise that money cannot keep. And we fall for it again and again and again. And so often, it's actually this kind of wealth and this desire for wealth that actually keeps us from living the good life. At least according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, where he says, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Notice that Jesus says the same thing. He says it twice, but in the second time he says it, he uses this hyperbolic language to express just how big of a barrier this is to the abundant life, to the full life that's found in the kingdom of God. One might be able to do it, it's certainly possible, but it would seem highly unlikely that it is a small minority, not the vast majority, who can handle and have large amounts of wealth and still walk in the way of Jesus. 
And all of us like to think that we're that minority, right? I know I do, right? But the truth is, if it's a minority, that's just not possible, or then it would be the majority, right? We all like to think, well, like other people can't do it, but I can. No, that's not what Jesus says. In fact, in a room like this, it's likely that maybe one, maybe one, might be able to possess a great wealth and still walk in the way of Jesus. It is a really, really difficult thing. Jesus' warning should not be taken lightly because ultimately what he's saying is that financial success as seen in our world can equate to spiritual failure. Chasing after it will likely lead us down a road of spiritual destruction. And this is a road that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7 when he says it is a narrow road that leads to life and few will find it. You are more likely to find life, Jesus says, by going down a narrow path. And in our world, that's probably a slower path with more twists and more turns, with greater resistance, as opposed to taking the road that is fast, is the highway, five lanes wide, straight to where we want to get to. Saying life is found on those other roads, the narrow path, the difficult path. Dave Ramsey says it this way, he says, we should live like no one else. Now, we tend to adopt the spending norms of our culture, which means we're not living like no one else, but we're trying to live like everyone else. <laughs> and when we do that uh, in a culture that's very greedy and very materialistic, that's what we become. This is one of the biggest reasons why we're all vulnerable to this idea of greed. And it's why many of us, whether we want to admit it or not, are sinfully greedy. Please know, I would put myself in that category too, okay? This is not just Derek preaching to a church. Derek preached to himself a lot this week. <laughs> the question that we have to ask ourselves, is there something we can give ourselves to? Is there a practice that we can give ourselves to in order that we might at least be on guard and push back greed from having a stronghold on our lives? Yes, it's generosity. Jesus teaches in Luke chapter 11, he's speaking to the Pharisees, and this is what he says says, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside also make the inside? But now, as for what is inside of you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Notice that Jesus points out greed specifically to them. He uses wickedness as kind of this generic term in which he's going to address in the woes that follow this teaching. But notice his encouragement when it comes to greed is about cleaning up the inside. It's about cleaning up the deepest parts of who we are. It's about the heart. And he says the way you clean that up is you become generous. Jesus says that the answer for greed is actually generosity. And although it is true that the more we have, the more we want, the less content we will become, the inverse is also true, that the more we give, the more content we become, and the happier we are with less. See, contentment is one of the most virtues in our world. We live in a world that says you should never stop striving or never stop moving up the ladder, Right? always going for more power and more authority and more responsibility. Why? Because with all of those things often comes more money. And so contentment is not seen as a virtue as much as it is a crutch for the lazy. But contentment is not about sitting around and being lazy. It's, it isn't about that at all. It's about being grateful for what you have and understanding that what you have is enough. That you don't need more in order to be free. It's living with a freedom actually for or from a desire for more, which is so hard and so difficult to do. 
A lot of people want to define financial freedom by saying that, man, you have so much wealth that like, you don't have to ever worry about money, that that's their idea of financial freedom. But I think actually true financial freedom is when you realize that all you have is already enough. That's real freedom. And that's contentment. And that is the aim that we should all be going after as followers of Jesus, is to be more content as we walk more closely with God. Paul has this teaching in the New Testament. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6. All right, we're going to look at just a few verses together in 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you don't have your Bible, there should be one in front of you. You can turn to 1 Timothy in there, or you can just uh, follow along because the words will be on the screen here. But he starts off by saying in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice how he starts out. He couples contentment and godliness together, and he says, this is a benefit for everyone. It's a great gain. It's good for you. It's a benefit to all who go after it. And here's why. He continues. He says, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Man, when I read this passage, when I read this passage and I thought to myself, I'll just be happy with food and clothing. Let's just be honest. Anyone in here just happy with that? I'm going to be honest and say nope. Nope. Most of the time, that's not enough for me. That's contentment. That's the contentment that we're encouraged to strive after as followers of Jesus. And notice he says that you're not going to take it with you. So why chase after more stuff that you can't take with you anyway? How many of us have houses full of things that are just going to be part of landfills and future garage sales? But let's keep going after more so that we can keep filling landfills and having more garage sales. Like, we all know how ridiculous it actually is. It just doesn't keep us from doing anything about it. And he says, like, really all you need are the bare necessities. Right? The simple bare necessities. <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> can I just say, when did they stop making movies that had really good, you know, biblical teaching? It? Uh, anyway... <laughs> Now, he says food and clothing. The word in the Greek for clothing is covering, and so I'd throw shelter in there too. That if you had food, clothing, shelter to protect yourself, you should be good, happy, content. But most of us aren't. Most of us are more greedy than that. He continues, he says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Notice how he talks about a trap being set, that deceitfulness of it, and how it leads you down this path of destruction, just like Jesus talks about. And then he continues, he says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You know, often this passage is misquoted as the love of money is the root of all evil. But actually, that's not what this says. The NIV is very, very good when it translates it a root of all kinds of evil saying that it is an underlying issue behind so many of the evils that we see and face in our world today. It is right there, and it is pervasive. It leads to all kinds of evil. 
The only problem is, and I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm prone to think, well, that's great. Contentment sounds awesome. Maybe one day I'll get there. Right? Like, I'll be content if I get a raise. Or I'll be content if, you know, I can get out of this season of life. Or I'll be content when I can buy a home. Or I'll be content when my college uh, is saved, my kid's college fund is all there and, and it's ready to go. I'll be content when I have enough to retire. <laughs> but notice that none of those things are talked about in Scripture. None of those things are referenced here, and honestly, they're not going to give you any more contentment than you already are capable of having right now. Contentment is when we can honestly say with all of our heart and with all of our soul, I have all I need because I have all I need in God. And He is enough, and He's given me enough. I don't need anything else. Now, the truth is, no matter how rich or how poor or what season of life, we can be content here and now. We don't have to wait for a future season or that raise that we hope comes at the beginning of the year or when the Christmas bonus hits our bank account. We can be content here and now. We can begin to cultivate this kind of, of contentment, changing our relationship with money through the practice of generosity. Generosity is and will always be about giving. It will always be about that by giving resources away to do good, stewarding God's resources, to bless and give in order to be a blessing. But one of the things that I think is often not talked about when it comes to what enables us to be generous is living a more simple life. The term theologians use to describe this would be the word simplicity. The idea is to take an inventory of your life and try and edit it down to the essentials of what really matters. Now, for some, you may already live a simple life out of necessity. The only problem is, in your heart, you're desiring more. You live pretty simply, but you don't really aspire to have a simple life. You want more. You want your life to give you more. You want to have more. But the reality is, if you get more, it will be gone very soon. Because you're going to use it to spend and fill your life with more things that you want and that you desire and you think you need in order to be happy and content. For others, you have plenty. Maybe this is the majority. You have plenty. I mean, you could easily live more simply, but instead you just fill your life with stuff. Right? You have no room for real generosity. To be generous on every occasion that you're presented with. Your finances are all taken up by travel and activities and then, you know, bills and obviously planning for the future. Your time is full of work, running from one place to another. You have very little to offer to anyone or anything. You are maxed out. And then there are some who have actually chosen a more simple life. And if that's you, please teach us your ways. You know what I'm saying? Like, teach us your ways, because we need it. You see, those who have chosen a more simple way of life, they are the ones who are the most content. They have the most margin in their finances, they have the most margin in their time, and they can be generous whenever God enables them to be, or whenever an opportunity presents itself. There are some of those people who are sitting in the room right now I mean, like, you would be shocked at how much money they have. You would be blown away. These are everyday millionaires who are sitting right here in this room, and you would never know because they're very humble and very simple people, and they are content, and they are very generous. And wouldn't you want that to be true of you? 
The question that we need to ask ourselves, though, is not do we want that to be true, but instead are we willing to do or live the kind of life that we must live in order that that is true of us? It always comes down to are we willing to sacrifice whatever it is? I'd encourage you to think about it this way. This is a helpful way for me to think about it. Uh, because I am prone to be greedy, okay? Like, I just, just to be honest, I'm just prone in that direction. I grew up in a very greedy home, and the greed of my parents le- leads me to desire more a lot of the time. And I have to have my wife smack me upside this head all the time and say, stop it, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, stop it, you don't need a new golf club. Stop it, you don't need a new car. Stop it, you don't need, you know what I mean? Praise God for her, because her parents are not greedy, okay? Um, but, but, I, but I tend to struggle with this. But, so this is the way I choose to think about it. If it's helpful for you, then great. You may disagree, but that's okay. I try and think about it this way. People should look at me, and based on the cars that I drive, and the houses that I live in, and the clothes that I wear, and the possessions that I have, think I make a lot less money than I actually do. That's really hard for me. And you may not agree with that, right? You may not think it's anybody else's business. Or I don't care what people think. Well, my guess is if you started to think that way, even if you don't like it, even if you find it as some sort of radical statement or radical way of thinking or radical way of being, my guess is if you actually thought that way, you would become more content and be freed up to be more generous because you would choose to live more simply. You would choose to say no to more things that you don't need. So I want to challenge you to something that might help you with this idea, okay? Again, this is just a challenge. You can choose to accept it or not, right? It's an invitation really more than anything. It's not a mandate. It's not like, hey, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. It's more of like, hey, it, like maybe, maybe this sounds like an invitation for you because you understand your own relationship to money and greed. And this is an invitation for you to become more like Jesus and more like the followers of Jesus he desires us to be. But I would encourage you to go look at your bank account. Your bank account will always tell the story. Just go look at your bank account and take an inventory. And try and identify 3% in your spending that you do not need to spend. Okay? 3% in your spending that you don't actually need to spend. Now, uh, the key word here is need. Okay? Like you need food. Right? You don't need Chick-fil-A. All right? Praise God for Chick-fil-A, but you don't need it, all right? Now, I'm not saying that you're wasting your money. I'm not saying that you're spending money on bad things, but I promise you, I am confident that we are all spending money on things we don't need. We are all spending money on things we don't need. Now, I also want you to know, like, this isn't about trying to be perfect either, right? Like, we're not trying to be perfect here. We're just trying to be more mindful. Be aware of our spending. Jesus' teaching is, watch out, be on guard. Pay attention. Or else it will just happen. You won't even know it's happened. So stay on guard against greed. You can't do that if you're not paying attention. My wife and I had to do this this past month. Um, Through the summer, we just spent way too much money. Um, We still were generous and we still gave and all of those kinds of things, but man, we spent way too much money, especially eating out, which typically happens for us because we have four kids and so it's like, man, we get home and we're tired and it's like, I don't wanna do that. I just don't wanna cook. I don't want to have to clean the kitchen after I cook. I don't want to do any of it, right? We're out of paper plates. Let's go to Chick-fil-A, right? Or let's let's go to the Mexican restaurant. Let's go wherever. And and we ate out so, so much. 
And I took a look last month as I sat down and was trying to reconcile our budget. And I said, baby, we got to stop eating out so much. Like, we don't spend a lot of money on things we don't need, but gosh, we eat out a lot. And it adds up fast. And so what we did is we started taking our food. We said, this is how much we're going to spend on food. We're not going to spend one dime more than this on food. We put it in another account. And once that money's gone, it's gone. We have a lot more money in our account this month than we had last month. Just because we were paying attention and being intentional and decided, you know what, here's a way we can try to be less greedy. Eat at home more. Do the hard work of getting a meal made and cleaning up after yourself. Maybe that's not it for you. Maybe it's something else, right? Maybe it's the new iPhone that just came out. I don't know. Whatever it is, just think about it. And I also want you to know, especially if you're living paycheck to paycheck, this is a great practice. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, pay attention. Be on guard. Because my guess is you could put money back into your bank account in order that you might be generous if you just paid closer attention to what you were spending between paychecks. See, part of being generous is uh, saying no to good things, to saying no to things that you can technically afford, right? Like, oh, I have the money for this. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. I have the margin to be able to, to, to pay this bill or pay this payment. I'll just finance it for 24 months. It's your percent. Whatever it is, right? Whatever justification that you make for it. It's about saying no to things that you can afford. It's choosing to say no. Because you don't need those things in order to be happy. And you don't need those things in order to be content. Everything you have is already enough. So, find 3%. Stop spending it, or at least for one month, stop spending it. And steward it to do good. Steward God's resources to do good. Watch out. Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today, and um, God, we thank you for your word that shows us that as, as good and as valuable and as uh, powerful as money is, it's dangerous if we're not careful, but that we actually are the ones you've put in charge. You've given us charge over your resources to do good. 100% of it. And we're called to steward 100% of it for good. And so, God, I pray that, that you, would, you would challenge us in the ways that we need to be challenged. I pray that if we feel challenged this morning, we would lean in, not run away. Because that's probably the place where you will meet us and where you will change us and transform us into someone who looks more like your son. God, thank you for blessing us in all the ways in which you have. So many of us in this room have such an abundance of blessing. And it's because you've given it to us. So God, may we never forget where our help comes from. And may we never stop thanking you for all that you do and all that you are. God, I pray that we might become truly content. That you might be enough for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.